a um, 15 minute rebuttal by uh, Pastor Taylor, uh, his first rebuttal to the remarks and presentation by Brother Akin. And uh, we'll allow uh, Pastor Taylor, without further delay, uh, to, co to commence his um, remarks. Thank you, sir. Well, we're gonna, um, just before I, I address a couple of things that Brother Akus Akil said, I want to, to uh, just finish one statement um, that I was just short of finishing at my last segment end. And I was referring to the 613 uh, Mosaic laws that the Pharisees, the religious Jews, were accountable for keeping. And in addition to that, were, there were probably thousands of um, subordinate laws that were kind of added to. They, they actually took a law and they would make a different application for it. So you take one law, you apply it to this situation, you got 20 situations, that becomes almost 20 different kinds of laws. So multiply that 613 times 20 or 30 or 40 situations, and you've got an unimaginable burden of law. That's why I said the greatest burden is religion. And what I meant by that is that the religion in itself, the law is holy, but it never produced perfection or holiness in terms of perfect obedience in God's people. All it really did was show them their need for God and their need for a savior. I'll say again, that mercy was God's heart. It was not my intention to, to uh, communicate to you that God can't forgive or is not willing to forgive. As a matter of fact, I thought what I said was the exact opposite. God established a sacrificial system in the book of Leviticus um, because he knew man could not uphold his law. And that sacrificial system was mercy. See, when, when, when uh, my dear brother shared about just, whether it's just to let another man pay the price for you, what I'd also say, and of course Jesus is not a man, he's the Lamb of God also, it wasn't so much just that God gave him, but he gave himself. Jesus was very clear, clear. He said, I lay my life down and I take it back up again. He said that three or four times. I lay my life down willingly and I take it back up again. It was not forced upon him. But for the 1,500 years that there was a sacrificial system, a blood sacrifice system that was initiated by God. It wasn't man saying, hey, can we get sacrifices so that it'd be easier for you to extend mercy? God said, listen, I understand your need and I'm going to provide for your need. So raise up Moses, raise up Aaron, raise up Levi, and I'm going to have this whole tribe be dedicated to making sure that your sins are covered by blood. That again was initiated by God, not by man, and that was because God wants to forgive. So if God initiated it, it must have been necessary. But it did not complete the circle. It didn't bring perfection. Jesus said, I didn't come to remove the law, but to fulfill it. If the law was fulfilling in itself, Jesus wouldn't have needed to come. If the blood of bulls and goats could have done it, Jesus wouldn't have needed to come. But when John the Baptist saw Jesus, he said, behold, again, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. In other words, perfect sacrifice, perfect and complete righteousness as a result of faith. In type, Abraham did the very same thing. Abraham is about to slay his son. But he saw a ram, a lamb with horns, caught in a thicket. And God said, listen, listen, I see your heart. Take that ram out of the thicket and sacrifice him in your stead. That's a type of foreshadowing of the coming of Jesus Christ as a substitute for us. But to show you the power with, with, with which and the ease with which God can extend mercy when there's a sacrifice. I said, there's power and ease for God to extend mercy when there's a sacrifice as opposed to when he didn't extend mercy for Aaron's sons and they died in the fire. But in the new covenant, it's easy. He said, your righteousness had to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. There are hundreds of laws they got to keep, which is impossible for anybody in this room to do. But watch this, on a cross, there's a thief next to Jesus. There's a thief, a convicted criminal. And he says, listen, when you get to your kingdom, remember me. Jesus turns to him and says, this day you will be with me in paradise. He never observed the law. He never did probably a good thing, a, a very, did, probably did very few good things in his life. He was a convicted criminal, but just that, that faith in him. He didn't say, I ask you for forgiveness. He knew he was a sinner. He simply said, when you get to your kingdom, Remember me. 
when you get to your kingdom, he understood that Jesus had a kingdom that was not of this world. Jesus was very clear about it. He said, if my kingdom were of this world, I would stand and fight. And think ye not that I would immediately pray the Father, and he wouldn't send me 12 legions of Egypt, Je angels. Jesus did not come the first time around as the, the lion of the tribe of Judah to establish a kingdom. He came as the lamb to die on the cross. The second time around, he'll come as a judging lion. And he had the understanding that he was the Lamb of God that John talked about. Probably in the backdrop, probably in the buzz in Israel, he knew who this Jesus was, even though he wasn't a follower. He was convicted. One guy on the right says, listen, if you're the Son of God, get yourself out of this trouble. But the other guy says, when you get to your kingdom, remember me. This day, we're talking about the way to paradise. This day, guaranteed. This day, absolutely. You will be with me in paradise. Why? Not because you observed anything. Because you believed on the one who observed and perfectly obeyed everything. My dear brother shit also, and of course this discourse is all in love. Some things that I just wanted to clear up. Um, yes, Adam did sin. And we're not saying that Adam, uh, that we inherited Adam's punishment. We're saying we inherited his predisposition to sin. I, mean, I, hope, I thought that was clear, but it's not. It might, might not have been. We're not saying that you inherited Adam's punishment. We're saying you inherited Adam's predisposition to sin. But one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. Why? Because all have sinned. Their sin brings death. Not, not Adam's. Adam's sin brought sin. Adam sinned, and all creation became sinners. <laughs> That's what it was. Adam sinned, and all creation became sinners. This is what you call an inherited disaster. It's a disease of all humanity, sin. So like when you go to the doctor and he says, well, what's your family history? What's in your generations? Does your father have this? Does your grandfather have that? Did your grandfather have this? He's talking about what's in your DNA. We, we had sin in our DNA because Adam sinned. He was our father. It became a generational curse. If you check out generational curses in the Old Covenant, you'll find that, that Abraham lied and said that Sarah was his half, his, his sister, and she was his half-sister. But then, uh, you know, Isaac did the same thing, and he said that Rebecca was his half-sister. Just kind of generational stuff. Well, sin was inherited, and the, the, the penalty is the same. In the first family, in the first family with Cain and Abel, we see murder operating simply because his father sinned, the spirit of murder, now is, is operating in just the second generation up until the days of Noah. Men's hearts were continually evil always. That's how that generational curse spread. So we're not saying that, 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 Adam, that we're paying Adam's price. We're saying we did what Adam did, so we have to actually pay what Adam paid. But the wonderful thing is that Jesus in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is called the last Adam. Not the second Adam. The last Adam completes the work. The first Adam, it says in 1 Corinthians 15, was made a living soul. The last Adam, a quickening spirit. He completes the circle, Revelation 1. I am the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father, unto salvation, unto paradise, except through me. You can work all the days of your life. You can do, nobody outdoes the religion, the, the religious duty of a Pharisee. And I understand there's some very dutiful Muslims, but I'm telling you, they're, they're the law of Moses and the subordinate laws of the priests, they were unbearable. Nobody did it. Jesus was very clear to them. He said some powerful stuff. Because they had condemned them for healing a woman on the Sabbath day. You know what he called them hypocrites? He said, you hypocrites, which one of you will not loose his ass or his ox on the Sabbath if he falls in a hole? In other words, you look around and see if anybody sees, if you see yourself, if they see you doing work on the Sabbath, because it was unlawful for, to, for them to do any work on the Sabbath. They couldn't even make a spark on the Sabbath. But he said, you know, when your interests are being threatened, when you're about to lose your livestock, and that's your money, you look around to see if anybody's looking. And then you go in and you lift, you do work, and you lift that ass of that oxen out of the Sabbath. But now you want to hold on to justice and say that I shouldn't have healed this daughter of Abraham who'd been in this situation for 18 years. What I'm saying to you is that there is no teacher like Jesus, never had been, never will be. He is the truth. 
It's not that he has to teach the truth, he is the truth. Truth emanates from his being. He's absolute truth. He is truth that was and is and is to come. He is the life. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. It's not that we have to get life, he is the life. Watch this. Mary said, listen, if you had been here, my brother would have been resurrected. Jesus said, I am the resurrection. I know there's a day of resurrection, but Jesus said, I am the resurrection. See, we got to see him in the fullness of who he is to understand our necessity for salvation is packaged in him. If I can just say this for a minute. Yes, God is merciful. And it's a wonderful thing to look for God's mercy. As, as a people, I know you look for his mercy, and it's beautiful. It's a beautiful, you're, you're, you're a beautiful people. His mercy is there, but his mercy is optional. I hate to say it, his mercy isn't guaranteed. I think even our brother Akil said that uh, he can choose. You know, it's, it's his, uh, his right to choose if he wants to. God wants to forgive, he will. If he won't, he won't, you know. But this is the wonderful thing, is that God provided for him a lamb. Abraham is wonderful because he said, as he's taking Isaac to the altar, he said, well, God will provide for himself a lamb. And I'm telling you, that was prophetic because he sure did. Out of his desire to love humanity, understanding our inability to keep law perfectly, we have law, but we can't keep it perfectly because the transaction has to happen in the heart. So as many rules and regulations as we have and obligations that we are given and laws that we try to keep, we continue to fail because of this thing called unrighteousness. The failure of moral law happens within each one of us. Even since we've been observant to Christianity and Islam, we have failed morally. But there is one who never failed. There is the sinless Lamb of God. The one who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This is the perfect pack package. But it's not something that Paul came up with, or Mark came up with, or John came up with, or Luke came up with. Read Isaiah. Read Isaiah 52 and 53. It's almost like you're reading the Gospels. It's, it's, it's amazing. And over in... Um, Psalm 22, when you get a, a chance to, uh, it's amazing. But I want to go on just a little bit. Um, I was going to address a few more things that my brother said. Um, let me see if we can even touch on those things. I don't know how much time I have left. Um, but maybe I'm going to move on because the time will, will not be of the essence if I do address all of those things. But suffice it to say that I understand that God is forgiving and he is merciful. That's why he supplied uh, for you a perfect sacrifice to guarantee salvation and he didn't leave mercy standing out there by itself because in the Old Testament quite often mercy did not triumph over judgment but as I said earlier when they brought the law of Moses and this is a proof, proof positive of this to stone the woman caught in adultery we understand that adultery is a heinous thing we're not justifying adultery Jesus doesn't justify sin he justifies sinners uh, he didn't come to, to, to pay for sin to be continued. And the Bible says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound, God forbid. But he did come to die and pay the price for his creation. And he was involved in it. So, again, in Ecclesiastes 7.20, on our own accord, there is none righteous. No, not even one. Jesus is the teacher of all teachers. He's the rabbi of all rabbis. He is the truth. In uh, Luke chapter 4, it says they marveled at his words. In Mark 1.22, they were astonished at his teachings. In Matthew 8.27, what doctrine is this that even the winds and the seas obey him? And in John 7.15, how knows this man letters, having never studied? Given his resume, I think we have to actually look at him. The one that did more miracles than there are books to contain them. The one who died and was resurrected. And I've got proof, proof positive on the resurrection too and the crucifixion. The point is, is that there is nobody with a resume that comes close to Jesus Christ. So we need to understand that his word is word. He is truth, absolutely, born of a virgin. There never been anybody born without the seed of a man except through artificial insemination. There wasn't any of that then. This was the seed of God. Miracle in his birth. Miracle in his life. Yes, miracle in his death and resurrection and miracle in his ascension. 
And the death and the resurrection were the most important piece because they atoned for by pattern established throughout the whole Old Testament, the sins of the people by blood. There's a difference between forgiveness and eternal life. God could temporarily forgive your sin today, but it doesn't mean that you are saved or settled or secure for eternity. This was about eternal security. That's why he says eternal life. So I'm not really sure where I am. But uh, I will read this last scripture. You have heard in times of old, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, if you look upon a woman to lust after her in your heart, you've committed adultery with her already, which proves that Jesus ratcheted up what righteousness really means. And on the basis of what goes on in our heart, not just what goes on in our body, everybody is guilty, especially the Pharisees, the religious people, because he was saying this to them. They thought they were good because they hadn't laid with women, but they had laid with millions of them with their eyes. He was saying, you need some blood. You need my sacrifice. I am he. And if you were Abraham's seed, you would believe me. If you were really Abraham's seed, you would believe me because he rejoiced to see my day. Thank you. So we'll proceed with uh, this second 15 minute segment and response by Brother Aka. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulullah wa Original sin, the idea that um, Pastor Taylor mentioned, um, it's inherited. And it wasn't that Adam's sin was inherited, but it was, as he mentioned, like sin is in the DNA. Uh, as Muslims, we believe that this is already in the makeup of human beings. As Muslims, we believe there's a proclivity to satisfying the self. And this is where sin comes from. It's where you want to satisfy yourself, and sometimes yourself calls you to things that's undesirable or impermissible. But it's a natural inclination. So it has to be home, it has to be guided. And in Islam, this is what laws are there is for. In Islam, laws are there to keep order. Laws are not there to obtain salvation. There's a difference. Laws are there to maintain order. You have to have law. If you have no law, you have disorder. You have to have something that curbs people who cannot control themselves to abide by the law. Everybody will not aspire or achieve the state where they can control themselves spiritually. There has to be something in place that keeps them in order and that's what law is. But law is not there to obtain salvation, that you fulfill all of these duties, so by that you obtain salvation. It's there to obtain or to maintain order. There are actions, righteous actions, that God gives us to do that can help us gain and warrant the forgiveness and mercy and grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we need to make that distinction. Uh, quickly, uh, Pastor Taylor mentioned about the blood, and he emphasized about the blood. It's true, in the Old Testament we find that they had blood sacrifices, but it wasn't just blood. Because there's occasions in the, in the Old Testament where someone couldn't afford an animal and they were given something else. It was to show your obedience. In the Quran, Allah says, it's not the blood. And this was in relation to Ibrahim alayhi salam sacrificing his son. He said, it's not the blood that reaches God, but it's your obedience. God is not interested in blood. God has no, 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 no need for anybody's blood. But it's your obedience to God that if you do it wrong, now you give something to show that how serious you are for your repentance. It's to show how serious you are in turning back to God. But God is not interested in blood. Quickly, in Psalms, it says in chapter 51, O Lord, Open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice. You do not delight 
in sacrifice, or else I will bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. So we see that it's not that God delights in someone dying or being killed, or something being killed to expiate your sin. But it's that you, you do something wrong and you show how serious you are in your repentance to God. Um, so but the idea of Adam committing his sin and because of that, we are the way we are, we don't believe that. When we look, and I mentioned this in the beginning, and I, and I know I didn't get a chance to do a full conclusion of what we read, but when you look at the story of Adam and Eve, what you see is the, you see the, 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 um, the archetype of humanity played out in front of you. You see how you are with God if you're obedient, how you are with God if you disobey God, and how you get back to God. Adam was there, he was given injunctions, he fell into error, he asked for forgiveness, God forgave him. We human beings, we are earth, we do things wrong, we ask God to forgive us, we sincere about it, we turn back to God, God forgive us. Adam and Eve was an example so we can see how we relate to God. Because we're not in God's presence. But how else will we understand how we relate to God unless we actually seen that displayed in front of us? So this story is not to say because of Adam's sin, because of that we are all the way we are. We were the way we are, even in Adam. Adam just showed us how we respond and deal with God. So Adam made the mistake, and when we see when we're in obedience to God, we're close to God. But when we disobey God, then we're distant from God. And the Bible says this very clearly. Let me cover a few verses. The book of Deuteronomy, first and foremost, Removing the idea of that someone can pay for someone else's sins or be held accountable. Book of Deuteronomy. The father should not be put to death for the children. Neither should the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. Now this is talking about a physical death here. But then there's also a spiritual death that's mentioned in the Bible that many misunderstand. Another one in Jeremiah, in those days they, they should say no more. The fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. So don't say that the children's teeth are crooked because of the sour grapes that the parents ate. You can't say that something's wrong with the child because of what the father did. You can't stigmatize a child with something because of his father. If his father was a murderer or a robber or adulterer, that child is born free and clean. He has a free slate. You cannot stigmatize him with what his father done in the past. You cannot. We cannot be stigmatized and say that I'm this way because of what Adam done. No, we cannot. There is a proclivity, there is an inclination in the human nature to satisfy the self, to satisfy desires. That's natural. If not, you wouldn't have desires. You have desire to eat. But you can't go to excess. You can't be a glutton. But the desire to eat is there so you can satisfy yourself with food. You have desire to drink. You have desire to be intimate with your, with your, with your spouse. These are natural good things. But when you go to excess, they harm you. When you eat too much, it harms you. When you talk too much, it harms you. When you do these things in excess without any boundaries, it harms you. When you go to excess in relations, marital uh, relations, outside of your wife, it harms you. But who's gonna say that going to your wife is something wrong with that? Who's gonna say something wrong with eating? Or drinking? Or enjoying your life? Buying nice things for yourself? There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with buying a nice pair of clothes. But when you go extravagant, this is where the problem comes in at. So in the human self, you have the desire. But if you don't hold the desire, then your desire takes control of you and it harms you. But if you control your desire and you keep it in check, then your desire, your desire is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. So Adam, as a result of Adam's sin, we're not the way we are because of Adam. 
That's how human beings were. Adam is just showing us how we respond to God. It's an ex example so we can see how we interact with God. Let's skip to the verses because it's a long um, section and I want to cover this. In the book of Ezekiel, in the book of Ezekiel, and I'm reading a lot of sections so we can get the context, so won't we say that it's taken out of context. Yet ye say, why does not the son bear the iniquity of the father? When the son has done that which is lawful and right, and has kept all my statutes, listen, he kept all my statutes, and has done them, he shall surely live. The one that has done right and kept all my statutes, he shall surely live. The soul that sins, it shall die. The soul that sinned, this is the soul that shall die. And it's not talking about a physical death. It's talking about a spiritual death. And the garden said, Adam eat of the tree, he will surely die. Not a physical death. Adam was meant to die anyway. He was meant to die anyway. The devil tempted him with eternity. If he was meant to live forever, how could the devil tempt him with something he already had? He tempted him with eternity, eat from this tree, and you'll live forever. If he was to live forever, that would be obsolete. He was never meant to live forever. When it says he should surely die, it meant spiritually. And I'm going to prove it to you from the Bible. The soul that sinned, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous should be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked should be upon him. But if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he has committed, and keep all my statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Does that mean if you're righteous you will never die? What does it mean he should, should not die? It means that he won't suffer this connection from God, a spiritual death. And this would happen in the garden. Adam sinned, and because of that, he was separated from God. So he died spiritually. He was disconnected from the divine presence. So the soul that sinneth, it shall die. But it says that the one that um, can, can, does right things, he shall surely live, he shall not die die. All his transgressions that he's committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. And his righteousness that he has done, he shall live because of his righteousness. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die? This is God's question. D does God delight in the fact that the, the wickedness should be punished and they should die and be separated from God? Says the Lord, and not that he should return from his ways and live, but when the righteousness turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and sin and does according to all the abominations that the wicked man does, shall he live? Can we say a person that is doing all kind of wickedness that he's living, is his heart alive? His heart is dead. He's separated from God. All his righteousness that he has done should not be mentioned in his trespass that he has tr trespassed and in his sin that he has sinned. In them shall he die. Yet ye say, the way of the Lord is not equal. Hear now, O house of Israel, is not my way equal, and not your way unequal. So we see, and it's a very long section there, but we see that in the Bible it's talking about a spiritual death and a spiritual living. Because it says, the one that does righteousness, he shall live and shall not die. But again, we, 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 let's go back to the beginning. We're trying to see how we get back to God. Let's look at Adam. Adam is in the beginning. Adam is there in the divine presence of God. He's in the paradise. He has enjoyment. He has everything. But he has one commandment. Just one commandment. This is to show us how we interact with God. And he falls victim to temptation and the whisper of the devil. When he does that, he's sorrowful for what he's done. Sorrowful and sorrowful for what he's done. He turned to God. He asked God to forgive him. He says, our Lord, indeed we have wronged ourselves. And if you don't have mercy upon us and forgive us, then surely we will lose. So he's there. He did something wrong. He recognized it. He repented. He asked God for forgiveness, and God forgave him. This is the cycle by which we interact with God. We're here. We're living our lives. We do the best we can following God's commandments. If we fall into error, 
we turn back to God, we ask for forgiveness, and we expect God to forgive us because that's what he promised. If we follow the conditions that, that entails with, uh, forgiveness and repentance. So the idea of sin um, as being in our DNA is not a matter of sin being in our DNA. It's a matter that our nature is prone to satisfy itself. When it's time, we like to sleep a little bit longer. We don't like to get up in the morning and go to work, but we got to do it. This is the nature of the soul. It's inclined to ease and, 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 and laxity and these kind of things. But God is saying strive, strive. Don't obey yourself, rise above yourself. And when you do that, then these actions will bring you close to me. But if you succumb to your lower self and allow yourself to control you, then you're gonna fall into iniquity and error and transgression, and then you're gonna find yourself dead, spiritually dead. Your heart is dead. And this is the connection or disconnection that we have with God. Either we, we, we're doing good actions, which we cover in the next section, the, the proof that good actions is what God is demanding of us, or we're not doing good actions and we're destroying our heart and we find ourselves separated and discontent and disconnected from God. I have one minute. Four, four, okay, well, um, there's a couple of rebuttal notes, but we we'll cover them in the next rebuttal section. There's a few things uh, that Pastor uh, mentioned, uh, but very, very fast. Pastor Taylor, he mentioned no one is uh, pure. As, no one is ever born uh, without a father other than Jesus, peace be upon him. Quickly, in the Quran, Allah says the similitude, the similitude of Jesus, is like that of Adam. When Adam, when Allah wanted to create Adam, he created him from clay, and he said to him, "Be and he is." Adam didn't have a father or mother. And Eve came from Adam. So Adam and Eve, neither one of them came into existence the way that we come into existence. Does that make Adam and Eve above Jesus? Because they didn't have a mother or father? Something to think about. So thank you, Reverend Akil. And uh, now we will have the first, uh, the second rebuttal, which is a 10 minute time span to Pastor Taylor. Thank you so much. I appreciate many things that Brother Arkeel said. <clears throat> I just want to bring clarity to a couple of things. Because uh, sometimes in communication, we can lose um, meanings and intentions can be misconstrued. Uh, um, first of all, um, the fact that Adam and Eve were created by God is, uh, is a unique thing. They were not born, they were created, which places that whole experience in another category. Um, Adam and Eve were created innocent. Uh, in other words, they had no experience with good or evil. It wasn't until they disobeyed the commandment of God. It says, and God commanded the man, saying, of every tree in the garden they mocked, thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou mayest not eat thereof, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. They had no concept either of either good or evil until he disobeyed God. Now, the disobedience was sin, but the fact that he ate from a tree that gave him an experience he did not have is what I'm talking about. We're born with an experience that they were not created with. I didn't say they were born in the first place, but they weren't created with the experience that, we're, that we inherited. We do have a predisposition. And my brother said uh, our souls are inclined to ease and laxity. Well, that becomes sin. I mean, bottom line is that we have sinned. God doesn't say laxity, he says sin. The breaking of the law is sin. God's law is sin. And God's law is good, and God's law is perfect. Now, can God mercifully release us from the consequence of sin? Yes. Does he always? No. So he provided for himself a ransom. Actually, he provided for us a ransom. John the Baptist, Jesus said something very powerful. He said, John the Baptist is the greatest prophet born of a woman. Now, I can take anybody's word, or I can take the statement of Jesus Christ. He said, John the Baptist is the greatest prophet born of a woman. And, um, and John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Yet yeah, it was on him. And why does Jesus qualify it? Because of the scriptures that my friend uh, quoted in Ezekiel. 
you might think that that referred to Jesus, but listen, this is humanity that's under the law of sin and death. Jesus never sinned. He wasn't under the law of sin and death, and he wasn't just man. He was God and man in the same package. He came down from heaven in John chapter 8, verse 17. Father, glorify thou me with the glory I had with thee from before the world was. We're talking about a whole other class of being who was predestined. The Bible calls Jesus the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Before Adam sinned, God already had a sacrifice, but God legally brought him through the earth realm through Israel through Judah manifesting in Jerusalem on a cross on uh, Calvary's hill to pay and atone for our sin virtually every major minor prophet spoke of this of his coming and read Isaiah 53 on your own because I can't do it in 10 minutes it tells you every detail including his blood being shed his death is all there it's in many places but I don't want to convince you read it for yourself uh, my brother also mentioned that um, that uh, God doesn't desire sacrifice. He quoted that. Um, but a, a broken and a contrite heart, that's very true. If you know that by understanding, what he is saying is that he doesn't want you to have a, a, a lamb in your closet while you plan to sin and then bring the sacrifice out and sacrifice, sacrifice it to atone for your sin. What he wants you to do is obey him first. It doesn't mean that God doesn't use sacrifices because God was the one that established the sacrifice system. And for 1,500 years, it was God's idea. And it wasn't just that God has an idea. He made it law. And if you didn't have a sacrifice, you paid the penalty. That means you were dead. So it's not about not wanting a sacrifice. That was one man making a statement in context that I understand you don't want me to go sin and then sacrifice for my sins. You want me to just obey you. Read the rest of the whole Old Testament, 1,500 years. God himself instituted sacrifice and commanded it under the law of Moses. And if you didn't do it, if it doesn't come down to the pigeon and the turtle dove and the he goat and the bullock and the lamb, then you gotta pay for it. Even the high priest, when he went in there, if he wasn't right, they had a rope tied to the high priest. And if he wasn't right, they dragged him out of the holy place. Because there were times when even the blood of a bull and a goat perhaps didn't atone. But there was the foreshadowing of Jesus Christ who would come. And that's the blood that can hold off the wrath of God. We know that we shall be saved from wrath through him is what he said. The Bible is very clear, and Jesus is the one that said it. He that has the Son has life. He that has not the Son hath not life, and the wrath of God abideth on him. I know that's a hard word, but I'm going to say it again. He that has the Son has life. He that has not the Son has not life, and the wrath of God abideth on him. But very beautifully, again in Romans 5, 1, Therefore being justified by faith in Christ Jesus, we have peace with God, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace. We haven't talked about grace. Grace is unmerited favor. It's not like mercy. Mercy is not getting something you deserve, but grace is getting something you don't deserve. And we don't deserve a pardon. We don't deserve a pass. We don't deserve a free ride. Yes, God wants us to be holy. That's why he sent the Holy Spirit. But he knows that you're not going to do it. And so this is the love of God. This is it. This is what it comes down to, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Reading uh, uh, John 3, 16 again, but going into 17, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoso Whoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We're talking about uh, we're talking about salvation. Salvation includes, and perhaps the biggest component is everlasting life. But the next uh, verse is the most important. In verse 17, for God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. That's what it is right now. John the Baptist is qualified to point to Jesus as the one who would atone for the sin because he is the voice of one crying in the wilderness, preparing the way of the Lord. In Hebrews 9, 22, it's very clear. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. I'll say it again. Hebrews 9, 22. For without the shedding of blood, that's the whole thing. It happened for 1,500 years. Things in the Old Testament, Testament patterned the New Testament. It was a type for the true. Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. And you know what? When you brought a lamb to the high priest, it had to be without spot, without blemish. And Jesus is that ultimate sacrifice. It makes no sense to turn away from a perfect sacrifice to actually present our imperfect sacrifices daily. Our imperfect sacrifices are received of God, but they don't guarantee eternal life. They're what you would call fruit. The Holy Spirit is the 
nature of God. He sends that, that we might manifest holiness. Can't have holy without Holy Spirit. So in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, now the fruit of the Spirit is love, peace, joy, meekness, goodness, temperance, which is self-control, long-suffering faith, and patience. Against such there is no law. If you want to be able to overcome sin, you got to have self-control. You can't have self-control without the Holy Spirit. You can't have the Holy Spirit without Jesus, because he's not given to the world. Uh, he's he's sent it to the world to convict the world of sin, judgment, and righteousness, but the world can't receive him, because he's the first gift that Jesus sends to, his, to, to those that believe on him. And the Bible calls him the Comforter. And Jesus would sin. The Comforter is not a man. The Comforter is the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. He said to his 12 disciples who were with him that he would be with them forever. He also said that he would be upon them and live in them. The Holy Spirit, the Comforter, is the one that comes and seals the deal. In Ephesians chapter 1, he's the first fruit of our inheritance. Once we get saved, we get filled with the Holy Spirit, and then we're called to be witnesses unto Jesus. Why are we witnessing Jesus? Because he's the one that reconciles us back to the Father. God wanted this thing to be absolute. He did it with, with, with bulls and goats, and it didn't quite work. I mean, it, it held off some of the, the, the judgment but it didn't completely deal with it as we saw with, with uh, Nadab and Abihu. It didn't deal with, with judgment. When it comes to the end of days and we stand before God, this is what's going to get you in, that your name is found in the book of life, which is in the hand of the Lamb of God. That your name be written in the book of life is the only thing that matters. It's not what, what, what you call yourself. It's whether your name is written in the book of life. And your name gets written in the book of life when you come through the blood. Again, Jesus said, I'm the door of the sheepfold. If any man climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. He said, my sheep hear my voice. And the voice of a stranger, they will not follow. The question is, who's his sheep? Everyone that hears his voice. My sheep know my voice, he said, and I know them. My sheep know my voice, and I know them. Eey, there's a transition. There's a transaction that goes on in the hearts of human beings where they know his voice. They know who's calling on them. Goes way beyond religion. I'll say this again. You could burn every Bible. Wouldn't stop salvation. It's transacted in the heart long before it was committed to the page. How much time we have, sir? Um, as we uh, come back to the next section, I'll try to prepare some evidence for the crucifixion and uh, the absolute necessity to come through the door, which is Jesus Christ. It's the easiest door to walk through. And as my brother Akil said, God did give mercy. There were times when people couldn't afford the, afford the lamb. So he let him off with other kinds of offerings because he's a merciful God. The powerful thing is that Jesus is the lamb of God and he's absolutely free. So, So normally we have a five minute break for stretching the legs. However, we're going to continue for the uh, proximity of time and the uh, time that we have the venue. And uh, we're going to use that time as valuably as we, as we can. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, rasulullah wa barakatuh. So inshallah, I want to first um, look at the importance of doing good actions and just recap uh, what we covered. <clears throat> we're talking about getting back to God and uh, obtaining salvation so we've seen again and this is very pivotal very important we're looking at the beginning because where did we come from how were we were how were we when, when we were with God what was the situation what caused us to go away from God and how do we get back so we have to keep going back to Adam and Eve in that first experience and see their example and how they dealt with um, the situation and how God dealt with them. God created us and in ourselves there is, again, an inclination to satisfy the self. That's natural. God gave us desires. We get hungry. We get tired. We have these desires that we have and they're natural human desires. 
Everybody was given them, whether they were born or created like Adam. Adam represented man, but there's nothing different in Adam that's in us. It wasn't because of an action of Adam that all of a sudden we inherited something different. Adam was a man like we were a man. So what we see in Adam, we see in ourselves as, as well. And this, we have to, this is what we have to understand. Adam is an example for us to look at and see how you live with God. When you obey God, you find yourself in the pleasure and in the proximity of God. If you disobey God, you find that you, you, you become distant and separated from God. When you realize your distance and separation, you want to return, you have to turn back to God sincerely and repent to God and thereafter do actions that's pleasing to God. God has given us actions, not laws, but given us actions that if you do them, they will hone the self, they will train the self. They will train the, the soul to do things that's pleasing to God. That's why, so we have prayer. Prayer is not a law, but it's an action that God gives you to purify yourself. So Allah says in the Quran that indeed prayer, true prayer, it keeps you from indecency. It keeps you from indecency. Pastor Taylor, he mentioned that without the Holy Spirit, no one can be righteous. You can't have self-control without the Holy Spirit. We don't believe that as Muslims. That may be a Christian point of view, but we don't believe that as Muslims. Allah says quite clearly about the Quran, He's giving you actions to teach you self-constraint. Ramadan is coming upon the Muslims. What does Allah say about Ramadan? That indeed fasting is prescribed for you as it was to prescribe for those before you so that you may learn self-restraint. It's a methodology, it's an action, it's a tool, it's a guidance that God has given you to teach you as a human being self-restraint. You learn these things, you learn how to control yourself. You don't wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon you to control yourself. If that was the case, then no one would control themselves for the most part because how many people don't have the Holy Spirit in them? God is giving you things that if you do them, they're methodologies to teach you how to control yourself. Allah said to the to tell the believing men, and the believing women to lower their gaze and guard their modesty. So this is how you control yourself as it relates to women. You may have a desire for women, but lower your gaze. You're teaching yourself self-restraint. Fast. You teach yourself self-restraint. Prayer. You teach yourself self-restraint. These are actions, good actions that God gave us to do to give ourselves self-restraint. Not that somebody come die for our sins to give us self-restraint. And the Spirit is going to come upon us and give us self-restraint. Because how many people claim they have the Spirit and they have the least amount of self-restraint? So the Holy Spirit being upon somebody, being somebody, does not necessitate or dictate they have uh, self-control. Because you see people who claim they have the Holy Spirit don't have self-control. So how do you explain that? Very quickly, the book of James. A couple of verses from, from the book of James to show the importance of having good actions. What does it profit, my brethren, though a man, he say I have faith and have no works? And I'm not talking about the law. I'm talking about good actions, righteous actions, giving charity, being kind to your neighbor, loving your neighbor, loving your brother as yourself. These things, good works. Can faith save him? Can faith alone save him? I believe. The devil says he believes. The devil believes in God. The devil believes in God. So why is he so accursed and wretched? If a brother or sister be naked or destitute or de of daily food, and one of you said to them, go in peace, but you have not given him what fulfills him or what he needs that's needful for his body, then what does it profit? Even so faith, if it has no works, it is dead being alone. Even so faith, if it has no works, it's dead. You can't say I just have faith and there's no works to show for it. But there's a this, this diff, different concept coming from Paul who believes that we're justified in faith. And maybe we can say, uh, introduce this for another topic, uh, but there is a discrepancy between some of the characters in the Bible and their writings that we have to look at and examine. It's very important. We have the figure of Paul who is very staunch about work, uh, faith and he's very staunch against works in the law. But then you have other people who testify, even the mouth of Jesus in the Bible, about how important works are. So we can get to that next time. And then the scripture was fulfilled, which said, Abraham believed in God, 
and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man be justified. By works a man be justified, and not by faith only. This isn't the Bible, this is the book of James. That through works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Don't just say faith is what saves you. No, works are essential to salvation at the, in conclusion by the grace of God. So faith is dead without works. They go hand in hand. A couple of points that my, 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 my brother Pastor uh, mentioned. Um, how much time? Okay. Is killing an innocent man love? He quoted John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, which is, we have to discuss this only begotten son also, but for now, he gave his only begotten son, or unique son, Trinity sometimes, um, he had, so that whoever believes in him should have everlasting life. And I'm paraphrasing John 3.16. Is it love to send somebody, to kill somebody because somebody else has a problem with sin? If this is my son, am I loving him? Is this love to say, listen, I'm going to kill you so that I can justify and free humanity up from sin. Which even after the death and crucifixion of Jesus, the alleged crucifixion of Jesus, people are still sinning. Sin still exists. Sin has not gone nowhere since the crucifixion. So the fact that the crucifixion occurred, where did sin go? Is it that you're being forgiven now? So again, as Pastor mentioned, that if there's no blood atonement, then there's no forgiveness. Which means, again, that you have restricted God from forgiving. You're telling God he cannot forgive if he chooses to because that person doesn't have a blood offering. You're making a blood offering binding between him and God's forgiveness. When God said, I forgive you, no matter if you have a blood offering or not. It's God's jurisdiction in his business to forgive whoever he wants to forgive. If you don't have a blood offering or a sacrifice and God wants to forgive you, God can forgive you. You mandating that God only accepts you bring a burnt offering before him or a blood sacrifice before him. And Pastor Taylor mentioned that God introduced this. You find it in the Bible, but you also find that there's uh, places where they, they, they didn't bring blood sacrifices or burnt offerings. They didn't bring this. And even today, for those who don't believe in Jesus, they're not bringing burnt offerings or blood sacrifices. Those Jews who don't believe it. And they still follow their law. So we see that there's some discrepancy here. It's something to be, to be looked at further. But we don't believe that it's love. This is not a display of love that God is showing love by killing the innocent man or himself even if you say that God assumed the human being, the human form, himself to come die on the cross for the sins of man. So God had to come and take a lesser role and die for the sins of humanity to show how much he loved them. We don't believe this is a display of love. The comforter. This is a whole other topic. We can introduce that topic in another discussion. Um, um, the in Islam, in closing, there's a very beautiful hadith, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said that it's written on the, the arsh of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, it's written on, on the throne of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, that my mercy supersedes my wrath.